And I'm going to reintroduce my colleague, Michael Hoffman, who will have a conversation with DIUX. I can We'll start with we'll start with the DIUX and what it stands for: Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. It took me a, a little bit to, to learn it, but we're really excited to have DIUX represented here because, in a lot of ways, DIUX is kind of I wouldn't say a golden child in some ways of this innovation movement, um, especially in the Defense Department piece. Um, just move over here. Um, this is something that, that has gotten quite a bit of attention from the defense secretary and the like. So we're really excited to have uh, DIUX partner Wynn Elder join us. Uh, Wynn has quite a career uh, within the Air Force. He retired as an Air Force colonel. Uh, he served as the commander of the 62nd Airlift Wing. Um, he's also served, uh, spent time as the executive assistant to the vice chairman of the Vo Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and when ha you know, today is the start of uh, March Madness. Wynn also is a UVA grad and quite the basketball fan. So we're going to take the next 20 minutes to talk about UVA's chances of winning the, the Final Four. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I could probably do 20 minutes on that um, as a Maryland fan, but it's different. So, <laughs> no, we didn't. That's, that's tough, actually. Um, <laughs> so, when come on. If you don't mind, uh, join us to uh, do the stairs and, and the walk here. Um, but... We can just sit down here. So, so I'll just kick off when uh, and let you, you know, uh, we started with an introduction, but if you could take five minutes to talk a little bit about uh, your role at DIUX and maybe just start with how DIUX came to be. Uh, sure. Um, so I, when I was actually on active duty working for Admiral Winnefeld at the time, we, we were actually at Ni National Science Foundation and they showed him a chart where it showed the percentage of uh, S and T R and D that was organically funded by the government and over time, and it w went from seventy percent down to you know ten percent today, or I don't remember the exact numbers. And he immediately said, "We got to we got to get out to the valley in a more meaningful way." And he and then uh, Secretary Hagel at the time started talking and came up sort of with the idea. And then um, Secretary Carter certainly uh, put a lot of effort into setting up um, a presence in initially Silicon Valley to specifically to um, be the connective tissue for the Department of Defense for commercial technologies that were relevant on the battlefield today and tomorrow that were, um, that the innovation and in R&D was in the commercial space was far outpacing what was being done in the department or could be done in the foreseeable future. You know, and the, the, the stat that, you, I use a lot that it just still blows me away is that just Amazon and um, Google outspend the entire federal government's R&D on autonomy 10 to 1. Just those two companies. Like this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, un, we're not going to catch them, right? That the, the consumer market is too big, too innovative, and they can pay too much. Like we're just not going to catch up. And so having a way to <clears throat> tap into those specific technologies in a way that was um, more accommodating or for especially non-traditional companies that weren't used to doing business with the government, uh, how to do business uh, on their terms. That's why, why I, the background of how it got set up. Okay. So there's been a mention this morning a little bit about OTAs and other transaction authorities. Uh, DIUX has been really uh, at the forefront of utilizing OTAs, but also they have a program called the Commercial Solutions Opening uh, Program, which was put together, if I'm uh, correct, with, by the Army Acquisition uh, Command. Um, can you talk a little bit about that program and how you guys are using that uh, to attract some commercial technology companies that might not be working in the sure. government space? Sure, yeah, I, and I think that, you know, OTs have been around forever, and, and lots of agencies have used them to varying degrees of success. Uh, Army Contracting Command in New Jersey was, we, we ended up using as our contracting shop. They had the most expertise. Um, but, and so it's not a new authority. The only real authority that's new for this is uh, in the 2016 NDAA, Congress authorized the Department of Defense that if a competitively um, run pr prototype OT, uh, it could go to f uh, straight to a production OT without further recompete. That's the only new authority that, that's out there. But that is instrumental in the incentive for a non-traditional small company to want to invest money in a, into building 
fielding a project and not then waiting two years through the FAR process. So it's still competitively um, sourced. It's just that, that it, it, out there they call it the valley of death, where they just sit around and wait and wait and wait. And so um, what the CSO, the uh, Commercial Solutions Offering, did was sort of just package up um, the, the OT, prototype OT, uh, process in a way that was just a little easier for business. It, 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 it's run sort of like um, FedBiz Ops in the sense that you, we post an offering online, anybody can respond to it. We, there's cuts you know, as, as they meet the various needs of the customer, and then the customer ends up picking one. But the, the CSO is really just how the OT authority is packaged for use. Okay. Um, after retiring from the uh, Air Force, he took two years off, uh, maybe from military service, working for a small fruit company. Um, but now, two years later, you've come back, working for that, uh, working with Apple. What are some of the lessons that you were able to learn from going outside of the Defense Department, and maybe now coming back um, and being able to apply them as uh, a partner with the IOX? Um, yeah. That, uh, first off, I would say, as as big as Apple is worldwide. Um, in the federal government, it's a relatively small player, and I saw the difficulties of trying to be a new entrant, so to speak, into a, in a, into a very established hierarchy of, of companies and how the system works and how difficult it is. And, I, and I, it just struck me like, you know, if Apple has difficulty with a certain system, then a small company probably experiences 10 times, whatever, you know, and so that was interesting to me because you're at Apple, but you're also small in this particular market. The other thing was how innovation is done in the commercial sector, especially in the Valley, compared to what I had seen called innovation in the government, and they're, and they're very different, um, how they go about it, and there's, there's reasons why. One's, a, you know, a return on investment model, one's a mission success model. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why why innovation happens differently in the commercial sector. But uh, what I have found is that, you know, government agencies are different, but they're not as different as they think they are. You know, the, the, when uh, General Selva and I traveled out to Valley, the first, when he first got confirmed, we went out to all the VC firms, and we were out there talking about cybersecurity. And, you know, uh, He's the vice chairman of the Department of Defense. You know, he's like, we've got real, pro you know, we've we've got very particular needs. And what struck struck us is the VC firms all kind of laughed at him. Um, they're like, you guys think you take data seriously, but you don't. We have customers that take data very seriously on Wall Street and some other places. And the point hit home for him and me that just like, wow, we're yes, we do have unique needs, but they're not quite as unique as we sometimes think we are. And so government agencies tend to talk themselves into that they're so special that they have to have everything custom built. And we could do that for decades, right? That doesn't, that, that there are certain technologies that we can't do that anymore. And so helping a, a government agency understand that things that are commercially built and produced can be more secure than what they built themselves, can be cheaper, can be upgraded faster, and that that loss of control doesn't lead to a loss of security. That's a huge cultural barrier for particular agencies. So that was something I, I, I learned a lot uh, okay. before I came back. So DIUX has a relatively small budget uh, when you consider, I mean, we're talking millions and millions of dollars, but relatively compared to the rest of the Defense Department, uh, relatively small. But at the same time, DIUX leverages that budget and leverages relationships with uh, different agencies within the Defense Department and as well as um, you know, venture capital firms or, fund rate or uh, financial firms as well. Could you talk a little bit about how, how DIUX works? Works sure. that even with such a small yeah staff? it is it's small but it's a, as I'm finding it's a disproportionately emotional set of money on the hill um, <laughs> that is true but, we, we'll uh, get we'll get into that soon <laughs> you know it is uh, yeah anyway uh, th I'll leave that there the um, so there's there's two types of projects there is the um, customer driven 
project. We, we as a, when I say customer from DIUX, it, it's a DOD agency of some sort. It could be a COCOM, could be a service, some agency within the service. They come to us with a problem and we curate that. It, that is it the right kind of problem? Does it, will it scale to a bigger problem? Is it meaningful? Is, but we try to um, use their money. And it, in some ways, it was designed that way that you just didn't have this big pot of money sitting at DIUX that people could go tap into. If you had a problem that you were trying to solve and you just needed help finding a non-traditional company, perhaps, or the technology itself and needed to do it very, very quickly, build and field quickly, then they could come to us to, as a navigator through this OT process and into the parts of the overall industry that they were less familiar with. And so. Th that a lot of our projects are a hundred percent customer funded. You know, many of our biggest successes, we didn't spend, we DIUX didn't spend any of our money. Now, in the other, the, so we have a little pot of RDT and E money that is, in essence, um, has been appropriated to us to, in our role as sort of a technology sentry out in the valley. Sometimes we will come across things that there is no demand signal from a service already established because they don't even know it exists in some ways or a combination of technologies as, as most innovation is, is the, it's already out there much farther along and so it's, we can use some RDT and E money to build sort of our own prototype and, and, and help build the demand signal at whatever particular service or agency makes the most sense. Um, that gets the most scrutiny because you know, in, in the commercial world, when you do, you can fail, right? With government money, failures less is, is frowned upon, right? And so, uh, but that's why the pot of money is so small, is it's primarily customer fund funded. Okay. So recently, DIUX got uh, a bit of attention, uh, at least in, especially in Northern Virginia, <laughs> with a recent uh, project called Rean Cloud. Uh, DIUX started working with Rean Cloud, and that. It, it, it grew. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll just let you kind of explain uh, with that because we were talking Will a little you? bit before <laughs> that, and uh, I don't want to explain the whole thing because I'm yeah. going to mess it up. But go ahead. Uh, if you um, talk yeah. About well, how I it guess and maybe the there is a there. so there was a um, a competitive prototype OT that Transcom uh, ran. A company was selected, one, and using the authorities from that NDA, it went uh, to a production OT contract. Um, there's a protest against that piece that's got to run its course. And that part, you know, I, I certainly uh, am not going to talk about. But the part that I think is somewhat helpful in this is that there is so much um, misunderstanding and uh, this is new stuff, right? The competitive part of the process is that during the prototype OT. And understanding, the industry's understanding that if you miss that part, you might be left out of the the production part. You, you sort of have to get engaged in the competition earlier than maybe some companies are used to, right? And so there's an education process just going on that this is a, still fair and open, right? The other part that was a little bit misconstrued was um, that there, the, the Department of Defense has a huge cloud initiative going on right now with the JEDI contract. This had nothing to do with that other than bad timing. Two uh, days <laughs> separated these things. Yeah, and so those two issues merged in a lot of people's minds or people were connecting dots that certainly weren't connected from, from our perspective. And so, uh, you know, the, the protests will run its course. I, you know, I was on the Hill a lot last week just explaining, you know, the difference between production OTs and prototype OTs and what the cloud one was designed to do. And so I, I think it's going to be beneficial in the long run that this happened because a lot of learning happened all, by all sectors, uh, us included, the last couple of weeks. So you did mention that, uh, you know, considering the size of the budget for DIUX, it does get quite a bit of attention from the Hill. You mentioned the fact that you were on the Hill. Why do you think that is? Why, do you think, um, you know, maybe some of the larger players see it as a threat and don't realize it? it's actually an opportunity that the traditional defense industrial base can actually work through? Um, are there any misunderstandings? Yeah, there? I think um, I certainly from my perspective, some of the um, concern about DIUX and the money is just a lack of understanding of what it's for, who it, and yeah, anytime you kind of upset a certain ecosystem, there's going to be, as it flushes out, people who may think they are going to lose out will will push back. That's that's normal. Um, I, but one of the things I hope that people learn through this is that you know traditional defense companies can work through 
OTs, ju there, there are two official ways. One is a cost sharing where one third of, uh, is paid for by the traditional defense company. And the other one is they can partner either with a non-traditional company or a small business. And we've run uh, three successful um, projects where traditional uh, companies have done, uh, have been, so Raytheon has done one. It was a counter UAS program where there were five different pro uh, prototype OTs. Four of them were by non-traditional, and then there was a sort of an integrator to take, and you know, counter UAS is a very, very difficult problem, and it ends up being, right now, the, the solution tends to be some sort of layered defense, you know, uh, uh, and a lot of the companies we are working with are developing some amazing new technologies in one part of that, but trying to integrate those it is not their specialty, right? And so that's a perfect role for, quote, a traditional defense company to come in and through an OT be part of that and, and be complementary with what their skill set can be. Well, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier uh, during the National Security Panel, but could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that DIUX has initiated, um, such as the one that you guys are working with NGA on right now uh, and how that might go forward? Sure. Um, so, well, probably the biggest demand signal that we get from our customers right now is either what's well, artificial intelligence, you know, and autonomy. Those are the two big demand signals. and. Uh, in the AI world, the three big use cases, and I think some of the previous spe speakers mentioned them, one is um, imagery analysis, especially overhead. It's a very complicated uh, problem set for, for uh, computers to handle, and we still, I think we still only process 10 to 15 percent of all the imagery that we take, um, it's, and it's going to get worse as the sensors uh, multiply. Um, so, tr so there's just a huge demand signal for help with how to process, evaluate, disseminate, and make use of, of intelligence in, in imagery form. Um, second is um, strategic analysis, war gaming. You know, for those of you who are familiar with AlphaGo and how that, like the fifth column, that's what, that's what people want to, where is that insight that humans have been unable to decipher over 2,000 years of warfare? Can you bring AI into a war gaming scenario to develop strategies, con ops, uh, approaches that we just haven't thought of before that would give us an advantage? And then the other part of AI that is a big demand signal is predictive analytics of sorts. Right now, it's primarily in the supply chain maintenance, big money to be saved there, as I think some of the other speakers mentioned. So in the imagery, we're, we're trying to, we've set up XView Challenge, which is a, Challenge. We have the largest uh, database uh, publicly available, thanks to NGA, that's been labeled. Uh, I think it's like 60 different subsets of objects, and there's a challenge to, you know, can we take that to a, uh, require less um, resolution? Can we get more object classes? And so there's a couple of diff different outcomes uh, for uh, how, of what we're looking for, but as AI and ML comes down to how big your data base is, right, in addition to the talent of the people working on it. But first and foremost, you need large data sets. So uh, by partnering with NGA, we were able to put together a database large enough that we think some pretty unique insights will come out of this challenge. Well, we have about uh, two more minutes, so I wanted to open it up for questions, if anybody has. I know we have a large U.S. Air Force contingent, uh, so I don't know if they had a couple of question questions here. Um, Matt uh, has the uh, microphone, so if you could just raise your hand, uh, we can pick it up. Anyway, right here in the front. Hey, uh, Justin Doubleday, a reporter with Inside Defense. Um, the, the last panel also touched on OTAs and talked about how um, you know the FAR had good intentions to set up, you know, um, to, to get against fraud, waste, and abuse. And it seems like OTAs are kind of seen like the the wild west right now. There are no rules. So I'm wondering, is there a framework that you know you can put in place for OTAs so that there's transparency, there's accountability, without it, you know, turning into another FAR where it's too constrained? Um, fair enough. I'm not sure I. Uh, agree with the first part of your question there that it's the wild west i mean there are 
very strict rules on, I mean, like I said, OTs have been around in US code forever. Um, it's a different approach, and I think the best advice I got when I was trying to under, get my head around them was don't, comp, don't try to look for an equivalency in the FAR. Like, well, what, what's the you know, FAR equivalent of this in CSO? It's a different process completely. And so some of those controls and mechanisms in the FAR, it's not there in, in the OT process. That doesn't mean it's um, less transparent or sloppy in any way. It's, so the biggest one is that FARs are requirement-based at, at their core, right? You have to sit, tell industry, here's exactly what we want in every kind of key performance, whatever. You know, I mean, you just go down the line, and you either meet it or you don't. And that drives out the risk um, in some ways. It also puts me in a cockpit many times in my life where the so software is 15 years out of date when, I'm, when the, the day it rolls off the production line, right? The, CS, the OT process is based on, a, on an outcome. Here's our desired outcome. How do you pr provide a solution to that? And as the customer, I can accept risk now. I can say that's close enough at that price, I'll accept the risk. Right, and so it is tra it, it's transparent in the communication between the customer's desired outcome and what the company solution, what they're providing, right? It's, and I, I is there additional oversight? I think, I think that as these become more prevalent and there's more discussion, I hope it just improves, but not in a way that kills fundamentally that ability for customers and vendors to work directly more quickly and for the customer to say, hey, I'll take the 92% solution and go to war today, rather than build it. So, and I think both are very useful. I mean, I, I don't think the OTs is, um, you know, put the far away. I think it's just a, another arrow in your quiver to, when you're looking, when you're a customer trying to figure out a solution, I think it's just a good additional option. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Wynn. I really appreciate the time.